Take your Bibles. We are in Luke chapter 13, and we begin the passage. There are certain moments when breaking news sends shockwaves across the nation, causing its people to wonder what just happened, why did this happen, and who is responsible. Does that sound familiar? Now, lest you think that I'm simply reacting in that first line of the sermon to the last 24 hours, I am not, as fate, I don't like to say fate, as providence would have it, that first line of my sermon was crafted about four days ago. As I looked at Luke 13, and what a gift God has given us. As we continue in the word of God, unpacking it verse by verse, chapter by chapter, we land upon a passage of scripture in which about three or four days ago, I landed upon this question to start, or I landed upon this idea that there are certain moments of breaking news that send shockwaves across the nation, causing people to wrestle with questions, what just happened, who is responsible, and why did this happen? And so that sets upon our hearts, especially on this weekend. But listen, this is about Luke chapter 13, when as we take a look at it in a moment, what we're gonna see is that rising from the, uh, from the background of Luke chapter 13 are twin tragedies that are headline news. And these issues come to Jesus. And what Jesus does with them is remarkable, but uh, tragedy number one was political murder. There was bloodshed. And this issue was brought to Jesus as a headline news. Issue number two is a workplace tragedy, which also resulted in innocent deaths. This issue is also raised by Jesus. My friends, listen, there are certain moments when headline news causes a shockwaves across the nation, and it causes people to wrestle with those questions. But it's fascinating that in the midst of these issues that emerge from the background of Luke chapter 13, that Jesus cuts through all of the headlines, and he gets right to the heart of the matter. Because for Christ Jesus, he, he's able to pierce through these things with excellent clarity to draw attention to what matters even more than the confusion of the culture. And what matters to him more than the confusion of the culture, my friend, here it is, it's the condition of your heart. The sermon in a sentence is this. Here we go. God is more concerned about the heart than the headlines. Very simply, He's more concerned about the heart than the headlines. As we take a look at Luke 13, and we will unpack it in detail. However, just don't miss this very central point that when it comes to these big issues that oftentimes captivate the attention of the culture and send shockwaves across the nation, when these issues are brought to Jesus, he cuts through all of them to get to the very core issue. Listen to him. He is much more con concerned about the condition of your heart than he is about the confusion of the headlines. And Jesus, with precision, is able to do that today. So New Hope, I rejoice in God's sovereignty. I rejoice in places like Luke 13 that we find ourselves at about 34 uh, sermons into a series when all of a sudden we find ourselves as a nation and as a people wrestling with some of these questions. But fundamentally, New Hope, I'm here to tell you that the central question that God has for each one of us is what does the sovereign God want you to do with him? That's the central issue. And what does he want you to do? Well, this is what he wants us to do. Turn to the Lord. Turn to the Lord. New hope. Uh, don't rush past us. Turn to him. Turn to him. Each one of us, each one of you, turn to him. That, that, that positional, that you're turning your heart, you're turning your focus, and you turn to him. Who needs to turn to the Lord? And when should we turn? This is what Jesus gets into first. And let me just give you a little uh, insight. Who needs to turn? Guess what? All of us. Every single person, and when should we turn? Today, now. Today is the day in which we turn and posture our hearts. Unless you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you just automatically think, well, this is a good passage for the so-and-so, or this is a great passage for the prodigal. I wish so-and-so was here. Nah, uh nah. -uh. It's a great passage for each one of us. Turn to him, turn to him. Who needs to turn? Let's jump in with the headline news. Here it is, verse one. The headline news is brought to Jesus, and the first headline is this. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans 
whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now stop there for a moment. I love verse one, it's a headline news. And and, uh, like the iPad at home or maybe your phone, I wish I could push on verse one, don't you? Just push. I wish I could push on that headline so I could read the story. Unfortunately, we don't have the story, so we have to settle with the fact that this is all we have on the story. And apparently, it was this headline news that was sending shockwaves across the nation. Uh, So let's just be clear about something. The headline news was this. Jews were murdered. Not just any Jews, where are they from? Take a look. Galileans, where is Jesus from? Galilee. So these are people that Christ uh, came from the same region. They were the same people group. Jews were murdered. Not only were they murdered, they were murdered by Pilate. Pilate, the reigning Roman face, uh, the, the face of the Roman Empire who was positioned in Jerusalem. And apparently these Galileans came from northern Israel. They came down to Jerusalem, which was the center of the temple worship where they were offering sacrifices. It was there, here it is, that Pilate, the Roman governor, authorized the execution, the barbaric execution of Jews while they were performing their religious sacrifices. My friends, it was political assassinations. It was execution. And if you don't know this, it would not be the last time that Pilate authorized the unjust death of a Galilean. Because in just a few short weeks from this moment, Luke chapter 13, Pilate would stand over that water basin washing his hands and he would say, away with him, crucify him. Headline number one, Jews are murdered. What's Jesus' response? We'll get to that in a moment, verse two. But I wanna go to the second headline briefly in verse four. We're gonna jump to verse four very quickly because Jesus is gonna bring up a second headline when he says, he references the tower in Siloam that fell and it crushed. Take a look at verse four. How many people did it crush? 18 people. Apparently, this is a workplace disaster. Whether the tower was poorly constructed or whether it was some cause of natural disaster, we don't know. Once again, I wish on verse four, I could just, I could press verse four and read the story. We can't. However, all across the land, from barber shops to shopping centers, the talk of the town was this. The talk of the town was the Jews are murdered by Pilate. And the second issue is, can you believe what happened when the tower fell and the rubble fell upon 18 people who innocently suffered beneath the debris of bricks? It was these two issues that uh, dominated the headlines and the conversations of people as they began to wrestle with what just happened, why did this happen, and who is responsible for this happening. These issues are brought front and center to Jesus Now, New Hope, listen, this is where Jesus cuts through all of the confusion, showing that for God, he is much more concerned about the heart than he is about the headlines. And in verse two and in verse four, Jesus is very clear. He says this, "Uh, do you think that these Galileans suffered because they were worse sinners than others? And in verse four, do you think that the people who died beneath the tower of Siloam died because they were worse offenders than anyone else in Jerusalem? A little side thought here, very ironic, that one of the worst workplace disasters in U.S. history also killed 18 people. In the 1800s, the city of Minneapolis, flower dust uh, ignited, causing an explosion. And listen, a seven-story building collapsed to the ground, killing 18 Minnesotans. And that captured the headline news back then. But listen, this is the point in time in which Jesus is addressing the issues of the culture. The headline news, Jews were murdered, innocent people suffered beneath the tower, and in which he says, do you think that these people died because they were worse offenders, they were worse sinners? Look what he says in verse two and four, I tell you, no. And then he cuts to the heart of the matter in verse three. New Hope, verse three and verse five, he repeats himself twice so as to prove the point that there is something far worse than dying under Pilate's execution order, and there is something far worse than dying beneath the debris of a falling tower. What is that? Take a look at verse three and verse five. He says, no, I tell you, but unless you repent. What is that? Turn. Turn to who? Turn to the Lord. 
Unless you repent, you all likewise will perish. Again, in verse five, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you all likewise will perish. Your Bible probably has this uh, subtitle, repent or perish. Indeed, Jesus is very clear that he is much more concerned about the human heart than he is about the condition of the headlines. And right here, he cuts with precision through all of it to get to the core issue. My friends, listen, the core issue that God is concerned about is that you and I turn to him. That there's this desire within our hearts to turn our, to turn our hearts to him, to turn our affections and draw close to him with all of our hearts. And this is not just a message for those on the outside. It is a message for those right here within the building of the church to recognize that he has called us to turn to him. Who needs to turn? Who needs to turn? Well, think of it this way. Uh, who needs to turn are, are these? It's sinners who need salvation. Do you know any? Yeah. How about prodigals who need restoration? Indeed. Or how about this one? Believers who need correction. Each one of us, this longing within Jesus' heart, repent, turn, or you will all likewise perish. New Hope, let me summarize this first, this first section by saying this. There is something far worse than being killed by Pilate. There is something far worse than being killed by towers falling upon you, and that is to die guilty under the hand of a sovereign God. And there is something needed. There's something, this great invitation that solves the condition of the human heart, and that is to turn to him, to turn to the Lord. Well, when should we do that? When should we? Yeah, well, one person got it. Randy, thank you, you're, yeah, you're good. When should we? Today. Jesus tells a parable. And the parable, the whole point is, do it now. Do it today. Here is the parable, beginning in verse 6. And he told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit for it and found none. So he said to the vine dresser, uh, that would be the property manager, he said, look, for for." Well, how many years? For three years now, I have, had, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? Let's stop there for a moment. Have you ever planted something that died? Last year, I planted seven hydrangeas. This spring, five were dead. So I tore them out, and I bought better ones, because that's what you do. When you plant stuff that dies, no fruit, no flowers, no, you're done. And the point of the parable is the farmer, has, he owns a piece of property, he plants a fig tree, and that fig tree, no fruit, no fruit, no fruit. For how many years? Three. Jesus is making two very clear points. First of all, don't miss the fact that he calls it a fig tree. Most people suggest that he's specifically addressing the guilt of the nation of Israel. Just as we would say that the eagle stands for symbolically America, so also in the Old Testament on four occasions. In Jeremiah, Hosea, and Micah, the nation of Israel is pictured as a fig tree. So in this case, most people suggest that he is very specifically talking about the guilt of the nation, their fruitless condition that they have failed to turn to him. And don't miss the second connection to the ministry of Jesus. He says, the farmer says to this fig tree, uh, as he's come along, I planted you, and he tells the property manager, I have come seeking fruit for this thing for how many years? Three and if you're not familiar with the story of Jesus and the timeline of Jesus, how many years has he been ministering in Israel? Three. It seems to be very clear that Christ is indicting the guilt of the nation, saying, I have looked for fruit, I have looked for fruit, I look for fruit, I have found none. Cut it down that it may not use up the ground anymore. But even there, my friends, listen, even there, this, this passage, this parable, there emerges a hint of hope of patience, the unwavering patience of a God who longs to give you one more chance, one more opportunity. Take a look with me at the next verse as this parable wraps up. Uh, listen to what the vine dresser says. Verse eight, and he answered him. That is the property manager answered the farmer. He says, sir, uh, let it alone this year also. Leave it until I dig around it and put on, have you ever said this word in church? <laughs> this is good. 
and put on manure. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Okay, what is this all about? I love this, New Hope, because what, what he's doing is Jesus is giving us an insight into the unwavering patience of God. For three years, he's been waiting. For three years, he's looking for fruit. For three years, he finds none. And in the parable, cut it down. But then we have the intercession of the Son of God himself. Please, Give it one more chance. Let me, let me nourish it. Let me cut around. Let me put manure on it and let it be. Just one more chance, one more opportunity. Maybe next year there will be fruit. Do you hear the longing there, the unwavering patience of God? I wonder how many of us test the patience of God over and over. If you're not familiar with the scripture, Bible warns us about testing the patience of God. Romans chapter two, verse four, I believe, says it this way, and do not despise the patience of the Lord, not knowing that his patience is meant to lead you somewhere. His patience is meant to lead you to what? To repentance. His patience, his unwavering patience of one more chance, one more opportunity. I wonder how many of your family members that God is giving one more chance, one more opportunity. How many of your prodigals, there's one more chance, one more opportunity. And what is that? It is God's unwavering patience. He's digging around the plant. He's nourishing it. He's putting manure over it. He's longing for that fruit to come to life. One more chance, one more opportunity. New hope, who needs to turn to the Lord? Everyone, you do, I do. When should we? Now, today. While there's time, the patience of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 says it this way. Now is the right time. Now is the day of salvation. Say that with me, would you? Now is the right time. Now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, 1. This longing within the hearts of the apostles that you would hear him. And today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Turn to him. Turn to him. As a nation wrestles, as people wrestle with, with the who's and the why's and the what happens, listen, Jesus cuts through it all because for God, he is much more concerned about the heart than he is about the headlines. And what I love about Luke, the next part of this passage, listen, Luke, he goes from the headlines, the political death, the workplace disaster. He goes from those headlines and he comes right down to the level of a human heart of one woman. One woman who responds to the call and comes to him. Turn to the Lord and watch what he can do. Look what he can do. Picking up in verse 10, what we find is a new section of scripture. Same storyline, however. Verse 10 says it this way. Now, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Stop there for a moment. Wouldn't it be great to have come here to church on Sunday and your guest preacher was Jesus? That's what's happening. He's a traveling rabbi for sure. He has high notoriety. He's traveling through the area and he's the guest preacher at the synagogue on Sabbath. Now, if you're not familiar with Jewish custom, the Sabbath is what day of the week? Saturday. That's important to understand for later. So there is Jesus, the guest preacher. And imagine the synagogue, this very uh, significant synagogue within the, uh, the, the city center in which you would have had the, uh, the, the leader, the, the, they call him the senior pastor. You would have also had the staff members, and then you would have all of the local people who have flocked out to hear uh, this guest preacher. You would have also had the 12 disciples, if not the 72. You would have had the wealthy, the healthy, the fit, the trim, also the poor, the mediocre. You would have had all of them packed around. Listen, in the midst of that congregation was one woman. And we get to meet her because Jesus is gonna go from the headlines to the heart. Behold, there was a woman who had had a disabling spirit for how many years? 18 years. Pause for a moment. When the tower collapsed, how many people died beneath its rubble? 18 people. And now what we witness is we meet a woman who for 18 years had been under the crushing, oppressive weight of this disability. What is the disability? Take a look with me. For 18 years, it says this, she was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. There was a crookedness of the spine 
18 years of pain, 18 years of crookedness, 18 years of shame, 18 years of things getting worse and worse, 18 years of this, of this hunchback, probably referred to as the hunchback of Israel, this woman who no matter what she did, no matter what things she tried to resolve it, from the chiropractic to the homeopathic to the, all of these things, she put money, she put time, but nothing could fix this disability. For 5,600 days, things got worse and worse and worse, and the disability and the hunchback went more and more. And what we find out later, it's not just physical in nature, because several verses down, we find out that Jesus says she had been bound by Satan for 18 years. Now, New Hope, let's be very clear on disability for a moment. Not all disability has at its root systems demonic issues or oppression, but listen, some do. And as we address things in our lives that go unresolved, we address it financially, we address it physically, we address things medically, we address things emotionally, we address things chemically. Listen, as we pour all of those resources, do not neglect the fact that at the very root system of some issues that are unresolved are spiritual in nature. May I testify for just a moment? I have unresolved health issues for three years that I've done everything, and I believe and I wonder at the core of it if it's not just spiritual in nature. And we just have to recognize that here is this woman who physically hunchback, crooked spine. This is a woman who, when she would have heard the word preached uh, in her local synagogue there, uh, when she heard passages like Ephesians, uh, Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 1 has a great verse, one of my favorites in the Bible. Did you know that? <laughs> Ecclesiastes 1, uh, when she would hear this word, I, I, I think she would have been like, yeah, I, I know that. Ecclesiastes 1, here's what it says. That which is crooked cannot be straightened. And I wonder if she heard the words of Solomon penned hundreds of years before her and said, boy, do, don't I know that. Here she is, crooked spine, broken heart, tear-stained face, and she's gathered there, and on that Sunday, or rather that Sabbath, gathered in the congregation of God's people with Jesus as the guest speaker, Jesus was about ready to say, Satan, enough is enough. And what a great thing for those of us with unresolved health issues that we long for, don't we? Whether here or there, we long for the day in which Jesus says, enough is enough. Here's a key thought. In all of our infirmities, no matter how tough, we long for the day, Jesus says, enough is enough. Look what Jesus can do. Look what Jesus can do with one person who turns to him. Here we go, next, next slide. Uh, what we have is this very intimate connection now between Jesus, the guest speaker, and this woman. First of all, notice he sees her need. Verse 12, you can look at it in your Bible. I'm, I'm repeating this by, hopefully by memorization. It simply says, and Jesus saw her. New Hope, can you picture that context? The congregation full of people with all the dignitaries and the who's who's and this and that. Where do you think this woman would be in the synagogue seating plan? Not in the front not in a place of prominence. She certainly would have been probably in the distance in the midst of Jesus' teaching from the Torah. Here he is. He stops because he sees her. What beauty this is. What a treasure we have here when it says Jesus sees her. Because how many times we come into a congregation like this, into a seating plan like this, and some of y'all are in the back row today and you think you came in incognito, nobody can see you, nobody knows you. Listen, there's a God of glory who sees every crooked spine, every broken heart, every tear-stained face. He sees you. The scripture is very clear from the Old Testament. It, it ascribes a name to our Father in heaven. In the, in the name of God, it says this in Genesis, you are El Roi. El, God, Roi, who sees. And look at this passage, Jesus saw her. And I want you to know, my friend, no matter what you come in today with hopeless conditions, there is a God in heaven, El Roy, who sees you. And not only does he see the woman, listen, he calls her name. Verse 12, it says this, and Jesus saw her and he called her. 
He called her forth woman, he says, not derogatory, mind you. I, I, I know that that could be derogatory in nature, woman, but no. He calls her forth woman, and at that moment, being called by the guest preacher to come in front of everybody, wouldn't you love that? No. You don't want to be the center of attention. For 18 years, she's been hunchback, and for 18 years, she can't straighten herself up, and in everything that she's, she's feeling the oppressive weight, and here he is, he calls her forth, and in that moment that he calls her forth, the next six words that he says are the most beautiful in nature. I love it. He says this, you are freed from your disability. And isn't there this longing within our hearts, no matter what you wrestle with, whether it's unresolved in nature or just this, you can't quite figure out what's going on either mentally or physically or medically. You can't solve things, but don't we, don't we long for hearing those words? You are freed from your what? Disability. This is a woman who in this moment was called forth. Jesus saw her. He called her forth. And notice in verse 13, he touches her shame. Notice in verse 13, it says that Jesus laid his hands upon her. I just wonder for this woman. I wonder how many times that this woman had, had hands that had been laid upon her to try to fix and correct hands of doctors, hands of chiropractor, hands of this, hands of that, but no human hands could compare to these hands of Jesus, those hands that created the galaxies that could heal broken hearts and those hands that could now in this place correct crooked spines. Those were the hands that were touching her now. These were the hands upon her. Now, as a side note, I do find it fascinating that Luke does not record what Jesus taught on that day. Jesus would have taught from the Torah, from the Bible. It does not record the text, but listen, it records the touch, and it causes me to think this, that sometimes a touch is more important than the text. Oh, that's good. Sometimes a touch is just as important as a text, and here she becomes the living embodiment of whatever the sermon was. He sees her, he calls her, he touches her, and in that moment, he frees her shame. Notice in verse 13, it says this, and immediately, immediately she was, what? Immediately she was straightened. Ecclesiastes 1, that which is crooked cannot be straightened, but guess what? In the hands of the Savior, that which is crooked can all of a sudden become straight. This is what our God does. Look what he can do with somebody who steps out, who receives that call. Who needs to repent? We all do. When should we? Now. Well, here's a woman. He sees her. He calls her. He touches her. He frees her. And in that moment that her back is straightened instantaneously, don't rush past that verse, my friends. That's marvelous after 18 years of disability that she is set free and immediately her spine is straightened. Perhaps she was one of the first ones. Perhaps she wrote it before Bill Gaither did. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul, something happened, and now I know he touched me, and he made me whole. Bill Gaither should give credit to this woman, because this is the woman who Jesus saw her, called her, touched her, freed her. But listen, it doesn't end there. He defends her honor. We pick up the story now in verse 14. Don't forget, Jesus is a guest preacher at the synagogue, and there was what I will call the senior pastor there. And he totally blows it. It's a little side thought. Yeah, sometimes spiritual leaders can blow it, can't they? And this guy misses the forest for the trees. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant, he's ticked. Oh, he's mad. Why? Well, here it is. I can't make this stuff up, man indignant because Jesus had healed her on Saturday, the Sabbath. He healed her on Saturday. He said to the people, so he, he like steps up to the mic as it were. He stops the service. Oh, stop. Oh, man. Just stop. And he starts to rebuke the congregation. And here's what this spiritual leader says to his local congregation. He says, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, six days you can do work. He says, come on those days and be healed, not on Saturday, not on the Sabbath. 
What a loser. In other words, he's saying, I mean, guys, I can't make this. He's saying, if you want to get healed, come back midweek. But not here, not now. What's the issue? Well, Jesus had not broke any Old Testament law, but he did break with their tradition, which had put a stranglehold on what could actually happen in the congregation on the Sabbath. So he rebukes the people to send them home to say, listen, if you want healing, you got to come back midweek. Today is not the day. Now is not the time. Here is not the place to which Jesus steps in now because he's indignant that this guy is attacking the very laws of God. Verse 15, the Lord answered him, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the manger and lead it to water it? And ought you not for this woman, and ought not this woman, rather, a daughter of Abraham, that's a Jew, a Jewish woman whom Satan bound for 18 years, should she not be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? Translation, my friends, if not here, where? If not now, when? Isn't that what we're gathered for? The congregation is, aren't we here for the praise of his glory and for the freedom of God's people? Which leads to this action step. The action step is turn to the Lord today. If not here, where? If not now, when? So many of us put off, we delay, we test the patience of the Lord. And here it is. We're gonna, now we, we kind of go over the overarching thing. Jesus cuts through the headlines. Political assassination. Uh, uh, workplace disaster. Listen, there's something much more important than, than the headlines, and that's your heart. And what I want, Jesus says, is you to turn to the Lord. Turn to me. Who should? Everyone? When? Now? What does that look like? Well, look what God can do with that. He sees her, calls her, touches her, frees her, defends her honor. When should we turn to him? Now. If not now, when? If not where? New Hope, Luke chapter 13. Jesus is inviting the people to turn to him. And from this point forward in Luke chapter 13, he lays out a pathway. You want to turn to him? This is what the path looks like. He's going to lay out a pathway for us to say, the choice is yours. Repent or you too likewise will perish. When should we do that? Now. Now. What does it look like? Well, here's a woman who did that with all of her heart. She steps out, and Jesus sets her free. And now he gives us a pathway of stepping out into repentance. The pathway, the choice is yours, begins with faith. Take a look at verse 18. How do you, Pastor Craig, how do, how do, you, how do you turn? What does it look like? What do I have to do? Faith starts it. Jesus tells two parables back to back. Both have the same point. Take a look with me at verse 18. He said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like and to what shall I compare it? New Hope, he compares the kingdom of God to two things. One, a mustard seed. The other, yeast. And in both cases, he, takes, he says that the mustard seed is, here it is, key phrase, took and sowed. Yeast is took and hid. Mustard seed is took and sowed in the soil, and over time it grows up into a tree, right? Okay. Yeast is took and hid into flour. Take a look at your passage of scripture. Not in just to a little flour. Your passage or your, your version will say something. It will say that, 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 that the yeast or the leaven is placed into flour. How much flour does your passage say? <laughs> the NIV says a lot. Yeah, good job, NIV. The ESV King James says this, three measures. So what's that? Well, listen, it's about 160 to 170 cups of flour. Now, when's the last time a recipe called for that much? Jesus' point is this. Listen, you take a little bit. You take the mustard seed, you take it, and you and you put it in the ground, or you take the, the yeast, the leaven, and you take that little bit of leaven and you place it into a whole bunch of flour and you work it through, all through it. And what has happened as a result? Both of them have exponential results. 
The point of the parable seems to be this. Whether you're talking mustard seed or whether you're talking the yeast in the flour, Jesus seems to be indicating here that it begins with faith. How do I say that? Well, you have to understand your Bible because Jesus talks in the scripture one other time about mustard seed. Matthew chapter 17, when he says this, that if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. In other words, this one small little thing that is hidden in nature, that seems so insignificant, there's nothing fancy about this little thing called faith. It doesn't look sexy on the outside, but listen, when you take that little bit of faith and you take it and you put it in the right object, it will cause enormous growth. The power of the faith is not the faith itself, my friend. Listen, the power of the faith is in the object, which is God himself. What is faith? Trust. It's coming to that place in your life where internally, there's that little thing in your heart that says, I can't do this alone. And so within your heart, again, it doesn't look fancy, but I'm telling you, a significant thing happens when you take that little piece of your heart and by faith, you place it in the Lord. That is a mustard seed or that's a yeast that you're saying, Lord, I can't do this. I am turning to you in the Lord. I am repenting and I am looking to you. Faith starts it. It all starts right there with something that is hidden and unseen. It begins that journey of repentance. Faith starts it. But notice, few choose it. Very few people around you will choose it. Now, maybe, listen, maybe you come from a family where it seems like everybody you know and your children and your parents, maybe so many people are believers. Listen, that's an oddity and praise God for that. But for most of us, The circles of our connections in our community and our family, for most of us, our family connections, our workplace connections, our neighborhood connections is full of people who are walking the broad road of destruction. Jesus is very clear that few choose the narrow door. Take a look with me. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying. Don't miss this next part. Where's he going? Toward Jerusalem. Since chapter 9, verse 51, he set his face like flint to Jerusalem. Every single step he takes in Luke now is headed to the cross. The Galilean is headed towards execution. He's journeying toward Jerusalem. And as he goes, here it is, someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? 1980s, I was a young man on the other side of Traverse City on a Sunday. I had the privilege to ride home that day with our senior pastor. I was a young kid. He was neighbors with us. And for some reason, I remember asking the question. I said, Pastor Dave, is everybody at church saved? That's the, that's the question here in the passage. This man who's walking with Jesus has the question. He wants to know how many people are saved. In his case, he says, will those who are saved be few? We gotta stop and just ask, what does he mean by saved? Well, from Jesus' response, we kind of get the impression that he is talking about eternal salvation. He is talking about who will enter the kingdom of God and be spared from the wrath of God because Jesus is very clear as he unrolls this thing that there is going to be a place called weeping and gnashing of teeth and also a place called the kingdom of God where people from the east, the west, the north, and the south all gather together at the table of God's kingdom, which is, by the way, why we do missions. Because we long for people to gather from east, west, north, south, from all over, all nations, tribes, tongues, and languages, don't we? We long for them to gather at the banquet table of the Lord. But in this passage, the question is asked is, Lord, will those who are saved be, what? Few? And I remember sitting in the back seat and listening to our pastor talk to me about the people in the congregation. New Hope, let me just tell you, I have not thought about that moment for 30 years five years, and this week as I'm reading the passage, I thought, wow, if I had the opportunity like he did with me to share with a young man who asked me, Craig, is everybody at New Hope saved? 
What a wonderful opportunity to say, my friend, I am deeply concerned that many people at New Hope are not indeed saved and walking with the Lord. Yes, they're in proximity to the word, but not everyone has ears to hear. And I would urge a young man like that to pray that God would open the eyes of the blind and open the ears of the deaf that we may hear because Jesus is very clear that those who are saved are few indeed. Look at what Jesus responds next. In fact, uh, you, your Bibles, what is the next word that Jesus says? He says, Lord, will those who are saved be few? What's the next word? Strive. Come on, guys. Come on, come on. I don't have all day here. Strive with earnest focus. I mean, that's what it means. With earnest zeal. To do what? Here it is. Strive to enter the narrow door. He says this, strive to enter the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able to. About a year ago, I had a friend sitting on my deck with me. He's a pastor from Indiana. We were talking about the narrow door. And he said this, very fascinating. He said, Craig, the road is not narrow because it's hard, but because few travel on it. Very interesting. Yeah, the road is also hard, but I think it's a good point here. Jesus says, strive to enter the narrow door. I mean, with earnest zeal, but the point is, few choose it. The invitation is open to all. Repent, or likewise, you all will perish. It is thrown out as cast out to the world to hear, to believe. Faith starts the journey, but Jesus' point, few choose it. So he says, strive, earnestly, zealous to go through that narrow door. It's narrow not because it's hard. It's narrow because few choose it. And there's coming a day which people will exhaust the unwavering patience of God, at which point it will be too late. And Jesus now pictures those people who are standing on the outside of the kingdom, knocking, saying, Lord, please open to us. You take a look at the next verse. Please, they say, open to us. But the master will tell them, I don't know where you have come from. He doesn't recognize them. They never started the faith journey. And so he says, I do not know where you came from. And take a look at what they say next. As they plead for entry, but it's too late. They plead for entry into the kingdom. And notice what they, what they, they call to mind, almost as if they're like, hey, you know, this is like, I, I, I'm telling you, Jesus, I, I belong here. Look what he says. These people who are standing at the door, verse 26, then you will begin to say, but, but didn't we eat and drink in your presence and you taught in our streets? New Hope, what they're saying is, we had such close proximity to you. I mean, don't you remember us? We were right there. We were with you in Nazareth. We were, we were there but Jesus will say, I, I do not know where you came from. Here's a key thought. And let everyone in earshot of a local church on the Sabbath day hear this. Key thought is this. Next slide. Proximity to the work of God does not guarantee entry to the kingdom of God. Proximity to the work of God. You, you could be here your whole life. In fact, you could preach from the stage and not have access to the kingdom of God because access to the kingdom only comes by faith in the Lord Jesus who died for our sins, was buried and rose again on the third day and calls us to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe, trust in our heart that God raised him from the dead. That's access to the kingdom. But do not mistake the fact that your proximity here on a Sabbath day will gain you access to the kingdom. No, faith starts it, few choose it. And Jesus goes on to say that there are two eternal destinations. One is weeping and gnashing of teeth and the other is the kingdom of God where people from east, west, north, south will gather at the kingdom. Are you headed there? Faith starts it. Few choose it. Take a look at the next part. The cross. The cross secures it. As Jesus is teaching, he's interrupted now by the Pharisees. 
if you don't know your Bible, let others help you at this point, are the Pharisees for Jesus or against him? Against him. That's important. Because <laughs> it looks like they're for him. You look at it, verse 31. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, get away from here. Herod wants to kill you. It looks like they're trying to protect Jesus from Herod. Herod is the reigning political regime figure over all of Galilee. He's overseeing the Jews. Herod is coming to Jerusalem. And so it seems to be that the Pharisees are warning him, trying to protect Jesus. No, 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 listen. They are trying to instill fear in Jesus so that Jesus turns on his tail and runs home. They're trying to get in the way to intervene. Why? Because Jesus is headed to Jerusalem. So they want to instill fear to, uh, to cause Jesus to turn around. But listen, if Jesus turns his tail and runs, it means that he doesn't go to Jerusalem. If Jesus doesn't go to Jerusalem, he doesn't go to Passover. If Jesus doesn't go to Passover, he doesn't stand before Pilate. If he doesn't stand before Pilate, he doesn't go to the cross. If he doesn't go to the cross, he doesn't go to the grave. If he doesn't go to the grave, he doesn't get rises again. Listen, they're trying to intervene in which Jesus now specifically says there is nothing that will stop the mission of the cross. He has his face set like flint. Take a look at how he responds to these Pharisees who are trying to intervene against the plan of God. Verse 32, and he said to them, you go tell that fox. That's funny. How would you describe a sly, sly mischievous, deceitful politician better than a fox? You go tell that fox. Well, what are they supposed to go tell that fox? Here it is. You go tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. New Hope, let me paraphrase all that for you. They're trying to get in the way between him and the cross. And what he says is, no, no, listen, you go tell Herod that nothing in all creation, not the evil Roman empire, not the cruel, mischievous Pilate, not that fox Herod, not even Satan himself will get in the way. Why? Because today I'm going to do this. Tomorrow I'm going to do that. And on the third day, on the third day, look at it, look at the phrase, I finish my course. It is a declaration that nothing will get in the way of him and his accomplished mission of dying, being buried, and rising again the third day. The finish line was in sight, and Jesus was securing salvation for the elect for all generations, and nothing would stop him. Glory be to God for that. He was not going to be deterred. Faith starts it. Few choose it. The cross would secure it. And then notice how the passage ends when Jesus weeps over it. He longs for this. It does not say that he weeps, but listen, the whole tone of this now, how this passage ends, is a, it's a lament, it's a, it's a sorrow-filled lament as he looks presumably towards the capital, towards Jerusalem. Some of you have walked those streets. You know the violence over the years. Your heart aches for Jerusalem, and so did his. Look at it. Oh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. Hasn't, hasn't Jerusalem been filled with violence your whole life? Hasn't often the work of God come there only to be rejected? What is God's heart towards it? Well, God's heart is a longing, an aching, weeping over the stubbornness of his people. Look at Jesus. How often would I have gathered your children together? Look at this imagery, church. How often would I have gathered you in like a hen who gathers her brood under her wings? But, but, look at, look at the, look at it, look at the, look. How often, how I've longed to gather you. I, I want you to repent, repent, trust, turn. Who? Everyone. When? Now. And how long have I called you? I saw you. I called you. I touched you. I, I, I freed you. I defended you, honor. But I, I've wanted to gather you. And, and look at the verse. Look at how it ends. But what? 
right? But you would not. He weeps over the stubbornness of his people. And I have to believe that from heaven above, even today, that all around, as people test his unwavering patience, I have to believe that there's an agony in which God longs for his people to come to him and how often we refuse to come. For God, there's something more important than the headlines, and that's your heart. What he wants is for us to turn to him. So let's bow our heads and do that now. Woman, you are freed from your disability. That verse rings in my mind. If you need a touch from the Lord today, very specifically, he is the one who can heal crooked spines and broken hearts. And he can bring sinners to salvation with one touch of his hand. Confess, call upon him as Lord. You're a follower of Jesus, some of you. Yes, indeed, you've chosen the narrow road. But even in that, I pray that you would seek him, call upon him and turn to him. Father, increase our affections once again for you. We surrender afresh to your work. Thank you for that longing of your heart. Thank you, Lord, for your tear-stained face that we we see, Uh, the desire for uh, you to draw your people back to yourself. Lord, we once again thank you. Thank you for your unwavering patience that leads us to repentance. Strengthen our nation. In the midst of the headlines, I pray that hearts would get right with you, that we would be ready for the day of your coming, that people from east, west, north, and south would all gather together to be received because of the name and the work of Jesus our Lord. It's in his name we pray. Well, my friends, both near and far, thank you for joining us for another great day of worship in the word here at New Hope Community Church in our online community. I look forward to seeing you next week as we turn to Luke chapter 14 and continue our series on a people prepared. Until then, know this, that you are loved.